Hello, Robert Bastian here of Laryngopedia and Bastian Voice Institute. Uh, this is a little discussion about vocal cord paralysis, uh, what it is, what causes it, and how we can treat it. And first, some background anatomy and function. The vocal cords are housed inside the larynx voice box that sits in the middle of the neck, and the vocal cords are about where my finger is inside that voice box. And uh, they function like a pair of lips. They open for breathing in the back, and they close to produce sound to protect the lungs. When we swallow, uh, just like a trumpet player buzzes the lips into a trumpet, we buzz our laryngeal lips into the vocal tract. Well, when one vocal cord fails to move to the midline, uh, then the other vocal cord, the one that still moves, is unable to reach it. And so we develop a breathy, weak voice due to extra air leaking through the glottic gap, the vocal cord gap. Well, what does the person experience? They often describe that breathy, air-wasting voice like this, or it becomes kind of a high pitch like this, and sometimes it sort of buckles, or sort of, it's high-pitched, breathy, and there's sort of a fluttering sound like that. They say they have to take a breath much more often as they speak, and so that leaves them with kind of a gasping feeling because they only can say they can only say a few words on one breath, and of course they can't be heard in noisy places. They experience a lot of fatigue, general fatigue, especially after a day of a lot of talking because of all the extra taking of breaths and running out of air. And early on, some people describe coughing on liquids. Well, what causes vocal cord paralysis? Uh, some of them are clearly related to a virus. The person has a bad cold, and then sometime later, early later, they develop this voice change. In other cases, we think it's probably post-viral, but the person, it was subclinical. It was, it was not remembered. And um, so post-viral, when it's idiopathic, which just means unknown cause, like Bell's palsy, if you know what that is, it's a facial paralysis that people sometimes just wake up with the face drooping. So there are other causes, obvious causes, like surgical injury, <clears throat> after thyroid surgery, carotid surgery, spine surgeries. There can be tumors that might press on the nerve, a thyroid cancer, esophageal cancer, lung cancer, or an aneurysm of the aortic arch. Uh, uh, not infrequently after intubation. I mean, it's rare uh, after intubation, but that in this group may be a, a cause. Either a simple intubation for a, a elective surgery or a longer-term intubation in the ICU. The nerve affected is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. It begins from the skull base. It's a cranial nerve, comes down into the chest, and then it loops back to the larynx. It's called the recurrent nerve. And uh, when we see someone with unexplained vocal cord paralysis, we typically get a CT scan from skull base to, to in, down into the upper chest to rule out structural causes. Now, a patient obviously is going to, under, is going to worry about that, uh, that we're going to find something, but by far the most commonly we don't find anything. Well, when a person has a vocal cord paralysis, what's going to happen to them? Is it going to recover in every case? Does it never recover? Uh, and the answer is that it depends. If the tumor, if a tumor was the cause and the tumor has been removed with the nerve, then we know it's not going to recover. But in the much more common scenario, uh, the, the nerve may recover with time, even if it's post-surgical. Let's say there was a thyroid uh, uh, surgery, but the surgeon knows the nerve is intact then we expect the nerve may eventually recover. Unfortunately, it can take a long time. Think of it this way, the skin heals typically in a week, basic recovery in a week if we make an incision. A bone, broken bone, might take six or eight weeks, but nerve damage can take up to a year. It's the slowest tissue in the body to heal. So there may be full recovery, but it can take a long time. There could be partial recovery. We may wait the full year, and it's better than it was at the beginning, but it's still not normal. Or there can be no recovery. If we wait a full year, there can be no recovery in some people. So unfortunately, there's no proven way to accelerate nerve recovery, 
and also there's no good way to prove, to, to predict who's going to recover and who's not. And that's uh, why we typically just wait. EMG has been proposed as a way to predict, but it's really problematic and we don't use it for that purpose. So uh, what do you need to know then about your options? Well, the first thing we need to say is that voice rest is not needed. Uh, a well-intentioned family or friend or even a primary care nurse might say to you, oh, I think you should be resting your voice. And that's because everyone knows that with laryngitis, uh, you should rest your voice, but, and that's the way they hear your abnormal voice. But in this case, voice rest is not needed. It would be actually counterproductive because the good vocal cord we need to keep strong and if we rest the voice, it's going to weaken and accentuate your, your voice disorder. So keep talking, even though it exhausts you, just use your voice as you need it and, and do not rest. Uh, okay, now what if we say, okay, I need to wait to see if recovery is going to occur, but can't you do something to help me while I'm waiting for recovery? And the answer is yes, there is a temporary plumping material that we can put into the vocal cord. You may be familiar with people who have their lips injected to plump them for cosmetic reasons. It's exactly like that, but it's the laryngeal lip, the vocal cord, that we're going to inject. <coughs> it can be collagen or, more commonly, a voice gel material. And again, that's for people who are struggling with coughing on liquids or their voice is so breathy that they can't teach or whatever their work is. And that procedure can be done in office with topical <coughs> and local anesthesia or under brief general anesthesia in an outpatient OR. We go through the mouth and inject the vocal cord and away you go home. The improvement with the gel can last six weeks to six months, more often on the shorter side, and it can be repeated as needed. Or we can inject a paste material, something much more long-lasting and it's said to be permanent but it usually eventually begins to fade maybe after a year or two and it can be redone. The definitive option is called medialization laryngoplasty. If there's no recovery after 9 to 12 months with or without some voice gel injections to, to help you while we wait, uh, or if we know that the nerve is ir irreparably damaged uh, or has been removed, then a permanent implant can reposition the paralyzed vocal cord to the midline. That is performed in an outpatient operating room again, no hospital stay. It's under deep IV sedation like you would have for colonoscopy, and so you're off in space. We numb, use numbing medicine for the actual procedure and make a little one-inch incision uh, on the front of the neck and uh, through that incision we go down to the voice box. We make a little window in the voice box and I think you can see it here on this model. You see that little rectangle right there. Uh, so that little window is made in the voice box and a silastic implant. It's like a wedge door stopper is placed through, uh, squeezed and pushed through that window and it snaps open and into position and remains there permanently. And at the end of that procedure, we turn off that sedation that's dripping in through your IV and rouse you just enough to say E, 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 and a few people have a very fuzzy memory of that but most people don't remember anything. And that is done to fine tune the placement. The incision is then closed with sutures inside, the skin closed with glue, a neck wrap is placed around to provide gentle pressure. And most people say that they're a little sore, it's nothing major, they, they don't seem to complain a lot of post-op pain. Well, there's no voice rest, but of course your voice is going to be poor until the surgical swelling goes down after a week or two. And what do we expect in terms of voice improvement? Well, if you begin with that sort of uh, 15 or 20 percent voice, this kind of a voice where you're blowing a lot of air and have that very poor voice, we would expect that you could get to 70 or 80 percent of normal function um, which you would experience as a major improvement, but perhaps not to your absolutely original uh, voice result. 
Well, can the implant be done earlier than nine months? Yes, as, as I've said, if we know the paralysis is going to be permanent, then yes. And occasionally there's a person who wants to go early at six months because they say, I'm willing to accept the 5% chance that it could still recover, recover and I just need to get on with my life. What about risks? Well, complications are rare and they may include bruising or a goose egg, a hematoma it's called, and that's really uncommon. I think I had two in my well over a thousand cases. Um, one of them I had to go back to the operating room and drain. That person unfortunately also got infected and I think that's my only infection. Uh, so it is pretty uncommon, but hematoma or infection can occur and then uh, we may need to revise. That's not a complication. That is intrinsic to this procedure. If you ask other surgeons who've done a lot of these, every one of them says, yes, I have to occasionally revise. And in it, for us, we think in terms of maybe one out of 10. Nine out of 10 get what they want the first time, and that's that. One out of 10, we come back to the operating room and uh, they usually say, well, I'm sorry I'm that one in 10, but it wasn't that bad the first time. And again, uh, we just go to the operating room. It's a little easier the second time because we're just making the incision, finding the implant, popping it out, and putting a different one in. So the scenario there is usually the person says, I went from 20% to 50%, and I was hoping for that 70 80%, and could we try again? And we say, yes, we'll, we'll try again. Now, what is the brief summary? Weak, breathy voice, idiopathic typically, CT scan just to make sure there's nothing pushing on the nerve. We can wait for the healing to occur nine to 12 months if you can tolerate the voice that you have while you're waiting. Or we can intervene with temporary voice gel material or longer acting paste material or go straight to the most permanent option, that's the surgically placed silastic implant. In each case, we're aiming for major improvement, but not typically to original equipment. Well, there's the summary, and thank you for listening.